Okay, guys. So we'll get started. Um, you all should have seen this um, description of our class. And um, uh, right at the top of the class, you know, I think you'll we'll always have the same Zoom call. And uh, we have LinkedIn group and we have Google chat space. Just because I'm thinking, oh, yeah. Okay. Now, um, what is the purpose of this uh, course? So the purpose of this course is that uh, is essentially to make sure that um, all of our students know um, the history of our research. And um, the reason is that um, that makes it easier for you to you know, understand what we are trying to say, what uh, your supervisor is trying to say um, in the ideas that I have kind of uh, driven uh, his research. In this context, that is expanded to say, you know, we also do, you know, kind of a team here, Valerie and Amitava, and they also bring a variety of expertise. So one is that we want all of you to be up to date on the research that um, we've done in the past, uh, that particularly your supervisor has done, advisor has done in the past, because you're going to build upon it. Uh, or at least you need to uh, get, you often find inspiration from it. There have been times where I have a PhD student writing his dissertation, and then I had to uh, ask him to look back at the work of the prior student, uh, because those ideas are directly and intimately relevant to what this student is working on. If he knew earlier on, the research would have been better informed. The second thing uh, that I see often happening is that when um, we're having some conversation and looking for new advances we want to make, we time and again find that the inspiration of those um, ideas have existed for um, a long time or ahead of, uh, uh, years ago, but we are revisiting. And uh, if you know of those ideas earlier on, you would um, be better equipped to uh, apply them. So I'll give you two three examples. Today's conversation will lead you to uh, see um, the work we did um, when I did my second company, where we used knowledge graph to build semantic search engine. That idea is uh, even is totally relevant to the amount the work that number of recent students have done last three for five PhDs, and that is uh, even you know uh, a factor in as we talk about knowledge infused learning. In just this morning talk, there were some. Uh, you know, if the students knew what we had done then, it would have made my job easier for, and you would have understood what I, we are trying to discuss even better. Um, what happens is that sometimes some core idea existed before, but the technologies have changed. So it is still revisit, uh, but knowing of those ideas and revisiting it. It does not have to be limited to just the work that I have done. Of course, a lot of other intuition people, a lot many and influential people have worked on it, so we should be also open to those ideas. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're doing knowledge infused learning or municipal care because of um, some level of belief uh, in me that uh, that's an area worth exploring and uh, you happen to find students and they, you know, the one students are working on it, the second works on it, new students see and they say, oh, I, I want to work in this area. And so, you know, we've chosen the area of work. So as an example, in 2002 paper, we talked about um, use of knowledge graph in, in conjunction with machine learning techniques. In 2005, I talked about complementary nature of uh, machine learning and uh, symbolic or uh, you know um, knowledge-based uh, 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 techniques or, or you know yeah, symbolic techniques in parallel with um, uh, the, the machine learning techniques. 
these ideas, you know, today I was just reading um, uh, an article on uh, neo symbolic AI, and uh, that particular more recent article I shared, uh, it's an archive paper, uh, talks about the same thing saying that, oh, good news is that symbolic AI, uh, you know, uh, AI and uh, a new uh, network based techniques uh, are complementary. Uh, and so, but you know, in, in some sense, in some form, those ideas were existed before. How, how did we see that that time, and how do I, how do, how does uh, this constitution change this time? Uh, is something we should be always aware of. And in fact, even you know, in science, you always build upon the shoulders of um, uh, other you know giants or the other people, right? I in my work, uh, I frequently talk about whenever Bush is. Um, 1945 paper, which has been very influential in how I think about it. Uh, recently, a very good, um, very important member of database community, Jiu Vidhanur, he just passed away this last week. But um, I remember walking on the um, uh, Pacific Ocean, uh, you know, uh, beach uh, at Asilomar conference and talking to him about semantics. In we are talking about year 19, early 19, you know, 80s or maybe at 86, 87, something along that line. But those are the core ideas that, you know, so discussions and which drew me to essentially pursue, if you look at lifelong um, uh, work, uh, semantics is at the core of everything I've done. If I took one word for the entire uh, in the journey that I had, it's semantics, right? So, uh, but my exposure to that came uh, you know, in conversation with Jim Larson, who with whom I have that most cited paper on the database, and um, you know, with Geo Mirror, right? So the similar kind of conversations I would like to have here, uh, you know, whether we have it in the, while we are walking or in this kind of classroom setting. Other thing is that I want um, uh, uh, the new PhD students to have one class with me. Uh, you know, because and and since I don't regularly teach, uh, the only the class that made most sense is this class, and that's why we are also doing this class. Yet another objective is that uh, I want you to um, use this class as a basis, as particularly for those of you in early stage of PhD or not even PhD, to use as a um, uh, you know. Um, uh, what you can understand the process of uh, uh, learning uh, for that will take you to, you know, the, in the end result is you becoming independent researcher. But uh, what I've seen in my own uh, journey is that a very, um, you know, continuously reading and watching other things have been very valuable to me. So you can see that I'm the most, um, uh, you know, uh, prolific uh, share uh, person, uh, sharer of I, you know, LinkedIn posts, right? All of you have the same access to LinkedIn as, as I do, but somehow I seem to be finding most material that seems to be relevant to our group and then I share it on all on variety of things. Um, but that, is, that means that I somehow, I come to that, right? I, I, I connect to the right network on LinkedIn or various other places where that information is coming to me. I'm filtering them and for what is relevant to share with different LinkedIn groups, right? But they all then um, refine our ideas. They give us inspiration. They give us new ideas, right? They help us keep up to date on a, we are working on a very fast moving um, area. So I want you to, uh, I want you to explain I want to expose you to a variety of things of that nature. And we would like to do that uh, specifically, see, to in your PhD journey, what is going to be important is that you read a lot of things. Uh, as I talked about, 10 papers a week uh, is what one of my colleagues expects. You um, participate in the innovation process. So this morning, I had a conversation with some of you who are either helping me uh, in my upcoming keynote at the workshop on knowledge uh, enhanced NLP at Triple AI, or uh, who are my co author of the article on the uh, neuroscience, uh, neuro symbolic uh, computing. 
and um, framing the work there it, that's a process of innovation that is also very critical then um, uh, i have been a big believer that you got to be open to you know you've got to be reading books um, now these days books are not the only purpose so you have to read from other places finally i want you to uh, uh, use this class as a vehicle to uh, continue the work during this course. Uh, so your paper that you're going to write, uh, that you all, all of you are engaged in, you know, uh, writing some papers, and uh, the presentations that you are going to learn to make, that would be part of, you know, this class's objective. So the grading would be based on how actively you're engaged. Are you keeping up with the new learning that we expose you to. Valerie will expose you to some ideas and Amita will expose some ideas. Are you learning that? Are you participating? Have you read this? If you give uh, advanced reading, have you done that or not? And then um, I, uh, your outcome in terms of um, you are working on a paper. The paper is completed before uh, April end, where the class ends. And that uh, you know you demonstrated that you are actually progressing in the research and innovation process. So that will be the case. And then the presentations that you yourself will be uh, you know be, uh, making based on the new things that you learn. With that, let us uh, let me start with the current today's agenda. The agenda is basically uh, to see uh, you know to point out some of the work that uh, I done over the period of time. And uh, um, I, I contemplated sharing, I have not done so, but there is, for example, when I was nominated for either AAAI fellow or ACM fellow, what did people see uh, in terms of uh, core contribution? Uh, and, uh, and, and then, you know, make sure that you guys are aware of them. Uh, and, and because some, they may be also relevant to, so let us go first with this way. Okay. So let us look at what has been the influential work from the past, right? And uh, not uh, I, I like to review with you some things that I am particularly proud of that are not necessarily most cited work. Also, but let us start with these. So that will show you over the period of years what. Um, uh, what have been influential and why? So clearly, the most you know cited work is this federal database paper, and um, you might know that essentially survey papers are among the most highly cited anyway. I mean, it's not a big deal in that sense. But uh, why in this area this is the most cited paper on multi database system or federal database? This is the most cited paper. The reason is that um, I was able to. Uh, uh, provide a very clear, so by the time uh, we did that uh, the paper, this paper came out in 1990, I started working on it in 1987. Uh, and it was basically a like year long process. So writing these kind of papers can be very time consuming, uh, but then it was working as you can see. Uh, I worked, my first job was at Honeywell and I worked on a heterogeneous database system called DDTS. So what happened is that in those days, um, um, one of the big information system problem was that companies had more than one database. An application needed access to multiple databases. So that came, led to the need for heterogeneous distributed database system uh, and or multi-database system and or federated database system. These are all terms that are so, uh, highly uh, related to each other. And, um, uh, uh, the first project for DGTS, uh, those are the days where essentially we are just starting to get mini computers after mainframes. So Honeywell was a uh, developer of uh, mainframes. Uh, 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 Honeywell merged with this other company, um, Uni, no. There's another company which also made uh, big computers and then Honeywell and. Not USS. Not USS. Uh, uh, oh, Unilever or what was oh. I yeah, I <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a kind of company that, anyway, two two mainframe developer companies, you know, merged and so Honeywell uh, and into Honeywell. Um, 
so um, uh, and then uh, so we were using RS two thirty two connection to physically connect the computers. The networks were uh, you know also very new, you know. So uh, and certainly TCP IP and the internet protocols were not all that. Yeah, there was IBM uh, protocol stack that was the most popular in those days also. Anyway, um, when we started connecting these um, uh, uh, databases, a whole range of issues came that were at um, hardware level, so system. Then at um, uh, syntax and signal processing level. So there was a FCD and ASCII, two different ways characters were, uh, I think it's Univac. Uh, Two, two different, uh, you know, um, uh, ways the you know characters were represented, right? So uh, the way a character was represented in one computer was not compatible with the way character was represented in another computer if it was from other manufacturer. So you have to worry about highly syntax, very low, very low level aspects, and that is syntax. Then structure. So for example, um, in those days. Um, uh, the relational model had just been introduced, but before that, there were a uh, well-known uh, model called hierarchical model and network models. So there were three well-known models, uh, uh, hierarchical, uh, developed by IBM, uh, and then network model, and then um, uh, a relational model. Right? So for database, uh, if you've done database course, you might have come across that, even though today people don't even talk about other models. And the conceptual model uh, in 1976 paper uh, by uh, Chen, uh, Peter Chen, uh, called ER model, entity represent model. And so that is a structure representation thing, right? And then came semantics. So uh, one of the most, uh, one of the influential paper here, you see here this paper called Changing Focus on Interoperability Information System from System to Syntax to Structure to Semantics. So what happened is that I was, uh, uh, you know, if I'm going to use that word, but I, I'm the one who more or less pioneered the uh, use of semantics here. So I, I was the first one to, uh, uh, one of my colleagues at Honeywell was uh, Jim Larson. He was senior member of the committee. He was tutorial chair, and he gave me the opportunity to teach a course on, uh, sorry, tutorial on heterogeneous distributed database system. And in 1987, so that was the first time anybody taught a tutorial on this heterogeneous database system or distributed database, you know, integration of database. And within that, I introduced a very, um, uh, you know, really the concept of a semantics as I was doing that. What happened was in 1987, I went to um, uh, 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 Venice. I had a paper at uh, Extending Database Conference in Venice. And uh, thankfully, I was, you know, see, this is a part of networking. So I graduated in 85, but in 87, I um, uh, uh, went to uh, uh, this Venice where um, I first went to uh, Hagen, Germany. Uh, that's in, um, uh, yeah, well, Germany. Uh, so my first flying trip from the US. So US was my first international trip. Uh, in 81, this was the first foreign trip. Um, that then I went to Venice, Italy, to at this conference called EDBT, and then I went to Paris, France at INRIA. Right, so it was a big deal for me, a young, uh, you know, uh, just recently graduated person to go to this place. The other places I was invited. Um, uh, I remember how hard a challenging it was to make, uh, you know, the logistics of that trip. You know, imagine in this very early stage of um, internet, more or less, uh, uh, to to coordinate and timing and pick up and uh, uh, you know all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so um, I came across a very interesting example. I went to a uh, restaurant in uh, Venice. I, uh, I I was just recently graduated from you know being a student, so. I would you know travel on shoestring, and I wanted didn't want to spend much time. I didn't have much money to spend on eating, so I found that uh, you know there's this a restaurant that had advertised um, uh, pizza for uh, three thousand lira, 
this is before the euro and uh, uh, at that time one lira was uh, 1000 lira was about one dollar so i said about three dollars when i got the bill for that i was charged eight thousand five hundred lira way uh, you know more than what i would have spent right and what happened was that on the three thousand lira list price uh, there was a tax and then two types of service charges or two taxes and one type of service charge that all added up to uh, uh, you know this 8500 so it came the question came to my mind is so so uh, what is the cost of the meal and or the what is the cost and, and you try to make understand you know try to understand the distinction between what it costs you to have the meal versus what is the list item of the of, of that food right you know right and uh, thus um, different person uh, different uh, databases for example in those days could essentially say you know restaurant and the cost of food one where for one place you can say three thousand other place it could say eight thousand five hundred and tell you what are the all the components of eight thousand five hundred right so that is the semantics what is the meaning of the cost of the meal? Does it include loaded, fully loaded cost, or does it does it is it just the base cost, right? So these and other things that uh, you know allowed you know basically uh, made me focus on the meaning of the terms and right? what they actually mean, right? So um, it is not enough to have uh, the you know sort of structurally uh, you know uh, structural. Uh, a representation would essentially say cost of the meal, but what does it mean? Does it mean uh, mean the uh, uh, the the uh, list price, or does it mean the uh, end price? Right. So that distinction is so important. So I recognize that, and then it became really a part of a, a whole bunch of work that we did, where the semantics started playing the role. So there were many influential pieces of work on schema integration and database integration before, but they were all missing uh, semantics. So I wrote a paper, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, this is called uh, 1989 uh, workshop paper uh, on the attribute semantics. Um, so basically, um, and there I learned from the knowledge representation world, um, you know, and maybe that is the kind of work also in cognitive science, whereby there is a distinction between uh, what is there in the real world versus what is that is the model world, right? So we, our, you know, and then there is a concept that uh, I think I introduced, but it's, I'm not 100% sure, called real world semantics. So you have model something, you have database schema, uh, you have object name, your entity name, and, but, what it is in the real world is this is just an approximation of that, of that right? And uh, 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 knowing that, that is very important. Why it is important? Because suppose I find a, uh, I model an entity, I call it something. The fact that two people will have the shared understanding of that will be only based on the uh, agreement they have in the real world. And the, the distinction they make in the real world would have to be reflected. Yeah, that would be the basis for telling you whether you are agreeing on this definition or not, this meaning or not, right? So there is a diagram that shows real world mapping to the model world and uh, urging us, you know, telling us that, look, if you want to come to the agreement whether two objects are the same or not in the data, database world or in the model world, you need to be aware how they are in the real world that was a fundamental uh, uh, thing and so the database people had entirely ignored these aspects of it right after that i i came to learn about you know other influential world where people talked about the semantics in languages and then pragmatics and uh, various other you know um, ways of thinking about all these things um so um so the first set of the work that I did were all around uh, databases, particularly my thesis was on distributed databases. Three different ways of uh, uh, concurrency control. That was a very important area of those days. 
Uh, and I had three papers and my advisor said, put together, you know, your thesis is these three chapters and some something around that. Those that was what it was. Um, you know, my thesis was highly unsatisfactory. You know, today I will not you know, pass myself, you know, for what I expect from my students. Um, so uh, a whole, um, but the main takeaway is that the role of semantics started to, you know, take shape. Now, uh, one other, um, uh, you know, area where the semantics started to play important role as it was that I also started to, uh, uh, Think about um, um, the um, semantics in the context of multimodal data. So I did a um, uh, I did a um, well maybe that came later. So this is another influence piece of work I want you to be aware of. I'm very uh, fond of this work. Uh, you know, so far uh, schematically, yet so near semantically, right? Um, and that comes up all the time. Things may have a very different word, worker and employee. They may or may not mean the same. Right? So again, they may not be, they, it, in certain contexts, they may be the same. In the context, they may be quite different. Where there is a consultant or contractor or says worker and em employee, employee has, um, is given the benefits and the others, uh, non-employees, who are workers are not given benefits. So there be all those kind of definitions. But this one had a very important uh, outcome. Uh, this, by the way, paper was followed up by this paper, um, 1986 paper, uh, 96 paper, this one. Semantics, uh, semantic and schematic similarities between database objects, a context-based um, approach. Why was this work very interesting and important? So this is the uh, uh, um, uh, work in which uh, in the database community, uh, I was among the, I was probably the first to use uh, uh, and adapt rather uh, the concept of ontology. So there was a, uh, the word ontology is not new, but in, um, you know, in, 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 in kind of, quote unquote modern computer science, Guha's thesis, uh, no, uh, not Guha, um, the guy who was with Siri. Um, so there are two very interesting and influential guys. Um, see if I can remember. Um, can you, can somebody Google uh, uh, in, intelligence at interface, comma Siri? And uh, see, there is a name of a person that should show up. Um, uh, he uh, was the founder of Siri. Uh, Siri was a company then that Apple acquired and then you know developed this Siri uh, agent. So he was the first one to use the word um, ontology in his thesis. Uh, I think it's Stanford, uh, and I think 1991. Uh, and I think his earlier paper on that was late eighties, okay? And the other very um, influential person was uh, R. Guha, Ramnath Guha. Uh, he's, uh, uh, you know, he's the person, Guha, he's the person who uh, developed, um, uh, uh, who worked uh, with um, Doug Lennett. Uh, or, uh, you know, on this very well-known project called Site that you all should be at least aware of. And um, uh, in terms of Site, uh, uh, and then he um, uh, joined IBM and he developed something called MC, uh, MCF, Metadata Concept Framework. But he's, he had a dissertation uh, from Stanford in, from KR Group um, that, um, was on context. So two very, very important concept, context. I use, uh, and, and these are, you look at the, you know, it's only two year, uh, uh, you know, or one year difference from the time that they talked about it. And I, reala I realized that uh, this is very relevant to uh, the Davis community and then start, I use both ontology um, and context in uh, the work on so far is so near and the schematic and semantic similarities aspect of it. 
uh, the fundamental thing is that that came from this body of work, which we may continue to be relevant, is called semantic proximity. So when we model anything, when we model um, uh, a, a, a uh, you know a database, a schema, a knowledge representation, a knowledge graph, what would happen is that um, uh, you have to make an assertion. Uh, fine, are these two things that are separately modeled same or different? The concept of sameness is a very challenging one. Is it same, exactly the same with uniform interpretation in all contexts? Or it is the same in some contexts and different in other contexts? Or it is the same for some people, different from other people in one application, it has different one meaning, other application, other meaning. Right? You go to finance, you go to taxation, you go to many other things. Always this, uh, you know, um, did you mean exactly that? This is what, you know, legal arguments will be about, right? So, um, uh, uh, in the early uh, years, what happened was that uh, people made a very simplistic um, uh, assumptions uh, or, or, or formulations about what is same and what is different. So, um, uh, uh, you could say that, uh, and there is a famous paper on the same as, uh, in the same as assertion in our in the knowledge representation and different meanings thereof. Now, it also uh, there's another uh, area that came up later on called ontology alignment, which is the revisit of schema integration uh, uh, work that we did in this earlier time frame. In uh, you know early nineties, the work we did became became very popular in um, after uh, about fifteen years, 12, 15 years in the semantic web world. So early people say, uh, make an assertion, these two are same, and they started to make the assertion saying, they are the same because the same words described it. I was, uh, I made, um, you know, uh, that 1989 paper made um, a particularly, um, there's a very well-known, highly cited paper on schema integration, which essentially would use syntactical naming as a way of identifying whether the two things are same or not what integrating or not i said that doesn't make sense here are very simple examples okay but then uh, i remember visiting darmstadt germany uh, and uh, you know there was a guy in peter uh, peter frankhauser so they uh, said here's an object here's an object <coughs> one on the link would say they are the same and then say, I can say 0 0.9, uh, point whatever, to zero, they are different. There's nothing in common. I said, this is mini. So that was another popular you know, favor. I said, this is, this is stupid, meaningless, right? The, there's no consistent way for two different people, for two different algorithms to come up with, um, you know, uh, uh, exactly the same value. Point nine for one would be seen as, oh, it's nearly the same. You should just call it same, round it off. For other case, it will be totally not the same. It's point, you know, it's 10% different. And, and what is that 10%? 10% may be the most important difference that is there. So this simplistic way of uh, talking about equivalence in relation with entity was, uh, you know, or something that I uh, argued upon. So some of this work became popular because of um, uh, that, uh, you know, in, uh, observation, right? And um, that led to my defining uh, something called semantic proximity. And I said, there are, you have to look at multiple factors to decide whether two things are the same or they are different. One uh, factor has to be the um, uh, uh, domain in what you are talking about. It should be part of the world in which I can make assertion or I can't. 
right? So, you know, uh, a word NFCP may have very different meaning in one part of the world versus in some other part of the world, uh, other, other, other applications of it, right? So, the, the context was the uh, first, uh, I, I defined a, 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 you know, four, four tuple or five tuple where, uh, you know, context was the very important key. Now, again, tied and conceptualization of context to um, Guha's thesis on context. So being aware of something like that, you know, gives you the benefit. But Guha talked about in very AI context. He was not in database or that world or not. So you read the mix, you know, very, the words are very different. Second thing was ontology. Or it may be vocabulary, terminology, word, you know, the, the terms that you use. The third um, uh, you know, component was how you, the language you use to model. You know, so you, you, relational language or relational model or uh, ER model. Uh, and uh, depending on the choice of model, you have the ability to, for example, use um, subtyping, right? For example, relational model does not have subclass. ER model, but, uh, core ER model does not, but there is a variation enhancement of ER model, which my collaborators developed at Honeywell called ECR model, entity category relationship model. That categorization is that, so depending upon the model you have, again, you can talk about the similar, same or different, because ultimately you still have to put it in the model world. And then the fourth component was instance. What do I actually know about those things? Right? So there is a concept of semantic proximity. You can also Google about semantic proximity or go to this um, you know, paper, the 1996 real general paper or the so far your so near paper, you know, keynote, and you'll uh, you know, uh, hear about semantic proximity. So this fundamental concept of how do you uh, describe and argue about when, whether the two objects are same or different, right? This is foundational, right? This is very core to anything you do. So today, if uh, you know um, Joey wants, wants to talk about um, uh, integration of uh, new concepts into a uh, knowledge graph or any new concept knowledge graph, these issues you know are germane still. Then uh, the artifact of all this was that uh, I also uh, developed the first tool on schema integration while I was at Unisys, um, uh, and uh, you know, which was an academic tool, 1987 paper in data engineering, and then 1991 uh, paper. I then I was I moved to Honeywell, uh, which was a tool called Braid, which was a more practical uh, you know uh, tool for use in industry setting. Uh, for schema integration. And there was a, I think a popular uh, paper, let, I don't know how popular, uh, let me see, it's on, um, uh, on automatic integration. So let's see if I can find. Uh, Maybe it is not in, maybe it's further down. Huh. This paper here on autonomic reasoning for uh, schema integration. So, um, 
one reason I'm mentioning this is that um, uh, there, there was a quite a bit of influential working knowledge representation of frame logic. And then there was uh, something called KL1, a knowledge representation framework and so on and so forth for formal representation, knowledge representation. Uh, and these were precursors to more work on description logics that uh, followed, uh, you know. And there we defined uh, formal concepts of, um, uh, you know, the terms like same, uh, similarity, called um, uh, uh, related, resembles, and disjoint. And so there's degree of relatedness. And that, uh, so the, you know, another piece that uh, once you talk about semantics, uh, immediately you get into the relationships. And so the relationships was another important piece uh, of, uh, you know, uh, theme throughout body of research that, um, that I did. Uh, so, um, now, um, one other thing that uh, came uh, along those time frame was um, this thing info harness and uh, the first paper on info harness was 1993 so i started this project um, in 1993 at uh, um, belcore um, and um, now what was 19 you know 1993 like 1993 uh, was the year when Mozilla came. So the first implementation of World Wide Web occurred in 1991. The conceptualization came in 1989 or 90. So there was a concept paper and proposal, which is still available online, uh, that Tim Berners-Lee did at CERN. But in 19, uh, and, but an uh, early uh, thing was mostly about HTTP, you know, for, uh, a protocol to exchange data between different computers or servers. And then come, came the work called a browser, where you can put up a page, have a link, and it jumps to, you know, it renders the page from a server, right? Now, um, uh, uh, the first practically usable browser was called Mozilla, followed by Netscape browser. So that was that earlier time frame, right? In that early time frame, I talked about we developed this project called Info Harness that uh, said we are going to use metadata to help you search for the content. So um, uh, look at this search and um, it throws this information. This was the first faceted search engine that I know of. Faceted is attribute based search. Not just the keyword, but the attribute, the property, right, that you can describe. So you could start making, um, you know, um, uh, and it was also the first one for the heterogeneous information with the Mozilla browser. And this became commercial product from Belcore in 1995. Problem was, I remember, uh, uh, I said uh, that this is uh, going to be a big thing because I was, see, we had the early still days, uh, World Wide Web was just becoming very popular now. It's still not, you know, big, you know, uh, worldwide. But I was totally saying that, after, you know, convinced that after instead of internet, you know, the web is what is going to take over. And there's a big business to be had. So I told them, uh, I told the Belcore that, uh, look, we have come up with the system in Farnes that can allow you to search data of any kind uh, from different source, you know, uh, any, any server on the, on the web. Uh, uh, search, right, from, you know, now, um, Unfortunately, um, you know, the companies have, um, uh, you know, various um, bureaucratic processes to say which project will go from idea to commercialization stage. And that process involved uh, 
uh, you know, writing a sort of business plan or something of that nature and require you to uh, sell it to um, uh, MBA type types. You know, I basically been in a grossly uh, uh, disappointed by MBAs as far as the business development goes. I uh, thought my life, but um, how would this MBA guys understand internet marketing? In 1993, 1994, what the growth of the web market was explosive, but it was starting at very low. Growth was there. You can see one, two, three, five, six, somewhere, but right now it's very small. So this business type to say, this, this market is too small. So they allowed us to make a product called used only by the baby bear companies, their own existing customers, instead of letting it the um, you know a product for the market. After we developed this pro product, uh, after we did the work, two other companies followed us. One was Excalibur. You guys will know, and I think it's probably you know uh, past history. The other is uh, Verity, which was a we became a, a big company later on, and then it was acquired by I think one other big company. Now, remember the how early we are talking about this. This was the time, you know, it was in 1995 to about, you know, late night, second half of 1990s, where browsing become very important. And the largest internet company and web company was Yahoo. And Yahoo, what was the Yahoo's product? Directly, Yahoo directly. Browsing. The so email was always a major uh, application by itself. Mm -hmm. So email, uh, you know, was simply the HTTP, you have it all. But with HTML centric thing and finding information. So I'm talking about, you know, browsing became the first important thing. And then what happened was that inter web grew at a state where browsing become impossible. Uh, I remember, uh, you know, Yahoo had 9,000 editors working physically uh, or every day an editor will you know index will be about 20 pages that they find. They have to find new page manually and they have to index it in their Yahoo directly. And there was the first person, first person with the job title called ontologist, her name was Sinija in Yahoo. Right? Google was which was founded in 1997 or 198. I think 1997, um, or uh, maybe 1998, somewhere in that time, um, uh, was um, uh, saw that and started to index web pages and came out with the search. Right now, it, you know, uh, like, what was the main reason? Uh, um, uh, so before Google came out. There were other companies who were doing search. Uh, there was a co company named XI, and there was another company called Alta Vista, very popular in those days. I, by the way, I remember meeting all those company uh, CEOs and CTOs because I'll, uh, what I'm going to say next. But um, so what? Um, um, uh, what was the significance? Why? Why Alta Vista? So, you know, Altavista search was based on what? What is the core um, information retrieval uh, paradigm or, 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 you know, or method? Yeah, here is PFID. It's all based on PFID. So, um, if somebody uh, wants to, um, and then the rules like that, your PFID can then more, how do you rank? More the word appears on the page, you rank it higher. So people started putting meta tags <laughs> and stuffing it. And so, you know, that would not work. People, you know, made, so what did Google do? Right. And what is page rank? Page rank is essentially using the user uh, you know, uh, the confidence that a person is showing into somebody else's page. So social construct, right? That Google mind. 
Why am I saying this? Because this remains extremely important even today. Right? Uh, uh, the, um, I'll, I'll come to that. That, that, that. that whole idea resurfaced again in our own work uh, with, later on. Uh, it was just in my mind, I, I skipped it. So, um, so Google came up with the search basically, right? Um, uh, that was better than others. So we were on the first one. Now, um, notice that we had this search many years before Google and many other people did. Verity was just behind us. It was because Belco did not allow us to make a product that Verity went ahead and then Google, uh, 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 you know, Excite, Alta Vista, and then Google came. And Google changed the game because of the page rank, not anything else. The other important thing that happened, which is more of a business thing, is that Google got a $25 million investment from Sequoia Ventures. I started my company in 1999. So there is a separate thing that, so in Four Harness, uh, uh, you know, we continued that work, but then he said, let's start now doing uh, images. So we started doing um, uh, image search also, along with text search. So we built visuals, visual analysis, which was one of the earliest or the first text and image search system. So that time, how, how you used to do image search? Yeah, uh, so, so um, um, uh, this is where Ramishan, you might have heard from me Ramishan all the time. Ramishan uh, is considered to be the father of uh, multimedia. He was a professor at um, uh, Michigan, and he had a company called Imageware. And in those days in image processing, there were three or four type, four type of things they would do. They will do color, they will do uh, composition, they will do structure, and they will do uh, one more thing. But these were the uh, you know, four things, uh, texture, texture. These are the four things they did. All of them are structural. None of them are semantic. But I say, no, with this, you can't say here is a white, white flower and a white flower. But this is white flower of Jui and this white flower of white uh, rose. You can't make any distinction at this kind of stuff that easily. And you want to, you know, want to search for white rose. There's nothing that those image processing systems give. So we built the mixed uh, search engine where we started taking the uh, description, the captions, and textual search on that, and uh, understanding of terms, concepts. Of textual capture in the page. Textual description in the page. On the page, surrounding and all that. So, so, so what we did was to um, uh, um, take the image or video. We also did so Tali, the search engine uh, that the company that I formed in 1999 was, um, uh, it's an applause where the idea is that it, it, uh, broadband and digital media are coming together. One hand is digital media, other is broadband. Unfortunately, we are too ahead. It took much longer time for, uh, there, there, there used to be um, QC images, quarter, Size images, I don't even know. When you, uh, they, they, you know, all images and video that can play on modem. That was the time. <laughs> <you're talking about. laughs> and and I said, broadband is coming. It came. It just took too too long, too many years. Okay. So, uh, um, so we were the first uh, uh, multimedia audio text uh, image and video search engine. Okay. But we are also the first semantic one. Okay. So um, uh, uh, the um, uh, I had a project um, uh, where called Video Anywhere. So first of all, okay. Now coming back to this. Um, so the important thing is that I added attribute-based search along with those four things about image. Now. Um, Ramesh's work had involved those four things. My 
include incorporate the text and the attribute based search and uh, correct uh, creating a metadata object for each image object and so you know having multiple attributes and uh, you know making that searchable so that's why if you look at um, uh, visual harness Mega, why don't you uh, 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 project, uh, uh, you know, just do Google search. That'll be, that'll be, I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to do that. Yeah, I mean, the work was a couple of years before it got published, but yeah. So I'm looking for an image to show you. So you can see a uh, different types of objects here, right? We even made a 3D visualization. So this is VR. You can see this VR, you can go into space. I'm trying to look for the interface for that. So you can search by both the image characters and, and, and um, other thing uh, and, and, and text and then uh, have text image all of them come together anyway um then uh um okay, there was a, there's a question I, I read this kind of somewhat the beginning of google hmm. google also had this problem image search problem and there was a company called esl game they used to annotate image using gaming game application and so on then google bought this and they made you know image leveler so same time or sometime you know, different. Maybe this is earlier. Maybe this earlier, earlier than that. Earlier than that. You see, remember this work um, uh, uh, was you know started in 1993. 1995, we started working. We even had a product. And 1997 uh, 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 and eight and nine is visual harness. In um, addition, in uh, in the same time, I started a little project called Video Anytime. And this was, in those days, uh, one of the most important thing about getting a digital content was table set-up box. Your company is selling them and a big deal. And here's what we realized. That we'll have a video coming from internet. We'll have video that you in your own digital library, you know, your local video. I said, why don't we make a search engine to allow you to search video anywhere? Your own video, uh, video on internet, and video in TV programming. And we came up with the idea of um, there were companies that were making uh, uh, interactive TV, interactive TV. So this TV was not dumb TV content, there were a lot of metadata element on that. So with that metadata for all of them, you can make a database and search and then deliver all of them. So a um, an agent uh, software extension of the table setup box to be able to search content anywhere of different media type. That is a technology that I licensed to spin off formally the Tali company, and I got um, you know two point four million dollar investment from a Redwood Ventures company, 
my problem was uh, this is of course the side thing not so important for you but was that i got my um vc was uh, not um sequoia and that vc was uh, greedy because market valuation was going up dramatically so if they if you don't take too much money that is you're not giving up too much stock but Another year down the road, you can, you know, uh, uh, your stock value went up much higher, right? So that's why you get, money is easy to get. Unfortunately for me, I got my money in 1999 in April 2000, where we had just a meeting to take the company public because you already had paying customers, which was un, you know, usually in, in those days, they did not have paying customers. You did yeah, charge right. us. Huh? You did charge us. Yeah, right. I need charge us. I have to. <laughs> Yeah. But I don't have if I have a charger. I don't think this will work. Give me this one. Oh, this this is wrong cable. Sorry, give me cable. USB. Yeah. And is this connected by Bluetooth? No. Can we do that? Okay. Oh, that So, um, uh, so that we, anyway, uh, so we'll tally, um, but the uh, most important. There's a very interesting article that came, uh, uh, you know, students may be interested in reading this article. Semantic search engine that reads your mind. And um, you may, uh, I guess, uh, but the, you know, here, here, this one. So again, you will see variety of very interesting, uh, you know, description of a, a, a very easy to understand as to the semantic background for the science. But um, let me, uh, with that, let me just jump to this uh, different uh, thing here. Um, no, I encourage you all to go through all these articles and just be aware of it. You, I'm sure you don't have time to read all of them, but see at least at a high level what they cover. Uh, but this was the um, this article that essentially discusses the 
you know, what we started, this was, um, you see, this is the um, part of the knowledge graph. Uh, this is from the 2000 slide in 2000. So um, I founded Kali in 1999. I took a half time sabbatical from uh, university. And um, uh, yeah, so Google took $25 million. So when the bubble burst, they could write. And when um, this bubble burst for four years, the VCs simply refused to invest in any money that had advertisement based model for, uh, you know, so this is how we will make money is very important for anybody to find, right? And uh, we, we, have, we had a search engine with several child. We even had a product for semantic advertisement. So if you look at the um, uh, pattern, Right, and it was even higher before. Semantic search method for creating a semantic web and its applications in browsing, searching, profiling, personalization, and advertisement. Yeah, this was um, the interesting thing about this is there are several interesting things about this. This pattern was filed in 2000 or in 2001. The word here, semantic web, right? Do you know what is the most uh, popular semantic web uh, article? Tim Lern, you know, uh, Tim Lee and Handler and uh, uh, this other guy. That came out in May 20, 2001. This was filed and in fact awarded in August in 2001, but filed in 2000, April 2000 or something, well before that. Tim Berners Lee and Hendler's talk article talked about what? What was their basis of, uh, you know, how, how are they, how are they uh, going to, um, how they say we realize the very well? Yeah, well, there is a vision here also. That's why I want to compare. I want to compare the two visions. Their whole article is all about software agent. What is the main use case? The main use case was that uh, the software agents that would make travel arrangements for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Imagine that. Okay. Here, I am showing how do you actually, and by the way, it was implemented. How do you build knowledge graphs or ontologies or world model, we called it. And then how do you uh, 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 do a search? And browsing. So you see here, you can, this is faceted search or semantic search where you can type in Moderna and it says, I know three Modernas, uh, uh, three Moderna. Moderna is in uh, actor, Moderna is in musician, Moderna actor in movie called uh, Abita. Moderna is in musician, of course, he was a you know, pop singer, and uh, Moderna is in religious artifact. <laughs> understand the semantics of the term, right? Day before Google ever did anything of that sort. Then it prioritized it based on the context. And then it gave you rich media reference page. This concept today is still even more advanced than Google's info page that they show today. Initial Google info page that they came out in 2016 or something, or 17 or 18, that was just Wikipedia, you know, uh, uh, you know, based uh, uh, summary. Here, there is a, uh, you know, image, there is a description, there's metadata. And there is direct link to various other things. In this case, I showed commercial e-commerce links, but there could be anything else, right? So very, uh, only Google has started adding link even now, you know, just very last two, three years. So um, this was a, uh, uh, you know, use of knowledge graph. So this is the very important. Um, so I had uh, asked you to uh, review one lecture, right? Did you guys look at it? Yes. Yeah. 
So, um, do you remember? Um, what, did I discuss this in that lecture? Yes. I did. Okay. So then I won't. This, uh, you have any question about it? So, uh, what are the three parts? What are the three components of this architecture? Huh? Okay. That's not the component as such, though. If you if you heard my article, then you would know. One is the knowledge agents. Second is the content agents, and the I think third one is the sources. So application. Application. So what is happening here is that you have how do you automatically create and maintain knowledge graph? And here, knowledge is coming from multiple sources. The difference between what uh, we are building, what Joey is building now, and what this was is that this was almost always, so we did not have unstructured sources. So the only difference is that there is unstructured sources. Otherwise, this was all done. We did more of these things than most people do even now today. About, is this a new object or the same object? Uh, or, 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 the, or, or existing object? If it's an existing object, should we merge them or not? These are very fundamental questions you have to ask. Now, this one had a major innovation. What is the major innovation? This one. Semantic enhancement server. What was the major innovation? Anybody knows that? Let me show you. Because this brings us to neuro symbolic computing, by the way. Okay, look at this thing here. So what is happening here? This is a 2002 paper published. So working done in year 2000-2001, where as a bunch of machine learning classifiers, and then there's this Pink thing, knowledge base. We are talking about complementary nature, nature of data driven and knowledge driven techniques. Now, of course, this part here, the machine learning is replaced by your neural network architecture. So instead of HMM base SVM, you are now using something else, BERT or whatever. This is your knowledge. This is the symbolic part. This is what is coming from the symbolic part. Uh, 
<laughs> oh, that is combined. That is, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is a uh, committee, you know, classifier committee, boosting method. So combine all of them. But you see that, you know, first of all, it is far more effective than the rest of them. And um, there's another uh, thing that shows uh, unusual capability. So if you look at this uh, uh, thing here, you see it understands one, two, three, four, five, six, six gram as an entity. Very unusual. How can you do that with uh, your data driven statistical technique? You have trouble doing three grams effectively. So you can't do that without symbolic knowledge. Right? So complementary nature of these things, uh, you know, symbolic part and the uh, data driven part was, you know, is very clear here. There's another paper and I would, uh, so I'd like you to really look at this paper. There's another companion paper of 2002 in ITP Internet Computing also, which is very interesting uh, from the perspective of application. But, um, and th this, this also talks about variety of aspects of document processing analysis. So, um, but this is your bona fide semantic search engine, right? The one I showed you diagram all that. It, uh, remember this, I, I had three paying customers in year 2000. Uh, Google talked about it in 2012, came out in 2013. And Google was, you know, quoted from, you know, things not seen. It's very nice, catchy thing. But I talked about it long, long, long time ago. Here from things, things, things not things oh, okay, okay. because they are they are keyword based now they are entity based. Uh -huh. But I talk about um, you know there is a keynote uh, uh, relationship at the heart of semantic web, and um, uh, uh, you know there is a uh, you know um, keynote in two thousand something and then two thousand eight PR conference um, where uh, I show um, keyword based entity based relationship and beyond relationship. Okay. So um, other paper that I would like you to particularly pay attention to is um, this one. Semantics for the semantic web, the implicit, the formal and the powerful. Now, why is this interesting? Yes. This explicitly says, so, so what happened? Why was this paper written? The paper was written because um, I did come from database and I was part of the semantic web community, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, community. But the semantic web community was going on the wrong direction, the, you know, Bannersley and Handler uh, kind of direction. So I, um, and I was always clear that that's not going to work scale, not, not, not is it, you know, going to give you the value. So, um, um, and I had seen the machine learning come up. We are talking about 2005. So this is the thing where Veka had just about, you know, come. Um, and uh, this is which allow you to use all these various, um, you know, uh, machine learning tools. You know, you can apply all of those. I basically argued here that they are complementary. That there is this table here. Hmm? 
Yeah, actually, um, somebody else has put it, but it is, uh, yeah, it, it is, but it is a uh, high quality paper. So you see uh, implicit semantics, formal semantics, the formal semantics is uh, the symbolic AI, a description logic based thing. This is, this is a semantic web world. And I wanted to tell the semantic web world, guys, this machine learning is going to be very important and it's complementary and pay attention to that. And that uh, also, uh, you know, so this issue of complementary nature of these two uh, is, and the, you know, value of combining them or using them uh, is uh, what this particular article talks about. Uh, it's, uh, you know, and um, so in that sense, this is um, pretty early uh, thing where, you know, obviously neural network is not here yet. So it's not that I, I can't say as neuro symbolic AI, but I'm just saying that data driven and knowledge driven or um, statistical um, symbolic, symbol, you know, AI, that part is what is talked about here. And then it goes beyond, and this is important. So you might uh, notice that recently I was, you know, brought up the issue of using relationship particular paths. Okay. The you see here, I was mindful then that this is going to be a challenge and a big opportunity also. And uh, I'm saying that the state that they were, this kind of stuff is going to take, uh, you know, a combination of both of these. And uh, hence, the, this graph is composed of a combination of implicit and formal semantics, statistical and symbolic. Now, words would not be exactly the same as what we write today, but the entire meaning was pretty clear. It is clear from this table that entity disambiguation question answering capability, context-based ritual and navigational and research or discovery style query capability require the use of all these ty three types of semantics. Okay. So, um, you know, please do read that, uh, you know, article, the, you know, 15 year article, if you've not done so, that's, that's really um, very important to get um, a good snapshot. And what you will find is that, now, you know, today we may not, you know, use, uh, uh, so, you know, this navigation research or discovery style query capability today today we may take a little different problem than that but they you know they are same class of problems that that uh, you know uh, still would um, be inspir you know inspirational use cases for what we want to do in um, the uh, new symbolic ai world now this is the other paper, Managing Semantic Content of Web, the two or two papers. So I showed you paper on semantic enhancement engine. And this is the other paper that I recommend that you look at. The other thing you should look at, this is, see this one, uh, this is a two, 2002 keynote I gave, uh, or 2003 keynote. Relationship at the heart of semantic web. Modeling, discovering, exploring uh, complex semantic relationship. So uh, that one, um, and of course, there's a lot of other uh, work. So if you go to, um, you know, my web page,
So there is, um, you know, on relationship research review, this is old, but this will give you a sense as to how there is a long running theme of focus on relationships. So this was written in 2005, so there's a lot more that is missing from here. But um, um, we will continue to find new opportunities as we you know, pay increasing attention to relationship rather than just the entities. And uh, you know, the fundamental you know, the focus as we go from the what I would call the you know simpler applications, the classification, vectorization, the uh, uh, ranking to more you know challenging application, uh, you know, endology, uh, you know, abstractions, uh, other things that we are looking at right now. That would uh, require that we increasingly pay attention to the relationship part. Uh, today, you guys don't have other class, right? <laughs> <laughs> so let me take one more topic. Um, but I want you to engage or ask questions. In fact, do you have any questions right now? Anybody from uh, people from on the online? Yeah. I mean, are you guys there with me here, or did I put you to sleep, or what? We're here. <laughs> okay. Uh, man, Kashika, it's pretty late for you. Um, Anything, guys, any, anyone ask any question, make any comment? Did you get a sense what we are, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe your question is, when did you switch to machine learning or AI, Dr. Shah? How did oh, when I switched, yeah. uh, I, I switched to machine learning uh, because I started this company. So until uh, uh, in 1999, right? We, when we, uh, I just showed you the paper uh, on the uh, 2001 paper on these classification techniques, and that's when we uh, we started using machine learning. So it's very early, actually, right? Because if you think about it, much of the uh, you know Vika and machine learning thing happened in the first decade of 2000, right? So. Just about the time that others started thinking about machine learning, but again, I was transitioning from the symbolic uh, part of the world to you know machine learning uh, to to involve machine learning. But I always saw there as complementary. I never saw that as a full uh, 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 primary or or a singular um, you know approach because I always knew the power of symbolic part. So for me, it was increasingly adapting or uh, using uh, the value, you know, taking the value from machine learning, but never the sole thing. So that is the difference. Some people, uh, you know, because I, I guess, start, I did my research in the 80s and such. Um, I come from and, and then started with uh, the database and then semantic web world. And, uh, and actually, there is a whole area I did not talk to you about because none of you are working on that. And we are not working on that in the services area. We have huge amount of publications there, uh, at least um, 20 papers with 200 publications each, statuses each, right? So it's a very large, uh, you know, body of work there. But we are not working on that, so I kind of, although it, they also are very uh, well known because of our use of semantics there. So you look at this paper here, uh, semantic e-workflow composition, the 600 citation paper, that's because of the semantic part of it. You look at here, uh, Meteor S, S is for semantics. You look at this web service semantics, digital S. So this became, uh, you know, uh, 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 the SA digital. So I just, there's a little digression that I want to uh, share with you. Uh, 
Meena Nagarajan, who had done a bachelor's in management at E.P. Silani, came to do master's, took one of my courses. Uh, you may have seen on the you know, uh, earlier play playlist, we had a course on web information system and uh, those kind of things. Uh, so that would be like, you know, info handouts and all this stuff, that would be very important system. Um, so she uh, took, I also gave the first, the second course that anybody gave was semantic web. Uh, and then I taught advanced semantic web course. Uh, my first course on semantic web was in year 2001. So that's very early because semantic web itself was coined in 1999 and the first work came in semantic web in only 2001. So I, that was the first year and I taught semantic web. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the interesting thing here is that Mina, Mina's first part of the work for the first three, three and a half years was in services. And um, uh, you can see here, uh, these are the guy, uh, Rama Akiraju and these two are from um, uh, IBM. We co opted them. They were, you know, um, interested in this. They are not the main uh, people, but they are from IBM, and it was good to have IBM uh, to get our ideas in front of a lot of people. There was a um, conference that was held, uh, a workshop that was held by World Wide Web. There were four proposals for adding semantics to services. And uh, this uh, uh, visual S was my idea, which, uh, you know, Kunal and um, uh, Mina developed. And um, Mina was, uh, Mina, you know, she was, this, I said she was master's, she's not in computer science, learned computer science, decided to go to PhD, similar to um, Revati, who just uh, passed by, she came for master's. And then um, um, this was 2005, right? Well, uh, Mina did, and very early, and Mina had a fantastic communication skill. I shared with you her video remember, on e commerce with advertisement, semantic advertisement video. Have you seen that recently? No? Yes, you guys will read my post. There was a post recently about advertisement where uh, people were, companies were complaining that in the Twitter, the advertisement is showing up in a very wrong way, in a wrong context. So, suppose, uh, you know, um, uh, there is a uh, there is an article about uh, you know people dying and uh, you know they're, they're putting in a box before Maria, and there so you advertise a you know a brand that makes luggage boxes or whatever. <laughs> it's very bad, right? So it was that. Remember that there was a video, and you should watch that video, and and, and you should pay attention how well she communicates. Well, we had all these senior people, right? So of course, I'm there, and then Rama and all that. I had Mina give the talk. She gave a fantastic talk. 100 people you know, gave a talk. Um, and uh, look at how, how well cited that work is. That became commercial, sorry, worldwide web standard called SA Digital. But then Mina uh, went for um, an internship. First with uh, a, a, a professor friend of mine at UC Berkeley. And then with IBM. And that was in year 2008, which is the year where Twitter was, you know, founded in 2007, but actually came out in 2008. And uh, I remember having a call. I uh, called, you know, she was, I think, still at Berkeley uh, uh, when I had a call and said it's very, okay, so social media is coming up. Then we got her, uh, I had contacts at IBM, long time contacts. See, Rama, she, she was at IBM. And in India, so we made that, uh, you know, so she went and did internship. And then she ended up switching her, dropping her for um, uh, services to uh, social media. Her dissertation was in 19, she, she was one of the few people that was invited to give a keynote before she got her PhD. This is unheard of, right? A student being invited to give a keynote. Um, only other known um, person was this professor at Oxford. 
he uh oh, what is his name the uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so he, he he had also given you know before he did mina is the second one person in my, that i know let me have that example it's so rare uh, the next one was Corey Hansen. also so our students have had amazing distinctions right and then minus has done a lot he was and uh, Yemen also had some very good writing talks. So, um, uh, you know, changing this kind of topic with a new opportunity because social media was not there. 2005, uh, Facebook was founded. But uh, the, there was no access to data, right? So, you could hardly do research. The Twitter changed that because of the access of data to data. So, um, Anyway, this is the pattern, by the way, we just reviewed, right? The, uh, this with 686 uh, citations. Um, the other important thing we did here was um, I introduced this term, semantic sensor web. That then became the standard semantic sensor network, which is this paper here. Uh, this one, the SSN ontology. So we applied another major distinction of uh, our research is that we apply semantics not just to the text, but to scientific data, to um, sensor data. Huh? Numerical data. Yeah, numerical data. You know, sense, whatever sensors produce actually, it can be a lot of. Uh, to um, uh, to uh, images to uh, services. So we got a lot of you know, dividend on that. In each of them, we have some of the most cited paper. Sensor, this is the most cited paper to my knowledge. And this is the idea paper original. And then you can see all this very highly cited quality of service. No, not quality service, sorry. There is a very high paper on uh, services. Yeah, this one. Web service semantics, and you can look at how many of these are services. Paper, semantic e workflow composition, and any semantics of web services. This is the first paper on that topic, um, along with the paper on OWLS. That was another competition. But remember, we had this competition, but we won. This is the last one. SCVS one. Standard became. The standard active visual came uh, as a direct lineage to visual as not ours. It's very interesting. Same thing for sensor, our approach worked. It was both uh, you know, transcending but also um, practical. So this is IoT kind of thing. Now, um, let me. Okay, there's a lot more to discuss, but let me just talk about one area and then we can call it day to day. So let me uh, uh, talk about the work by Kema4 because it's kind of related to this. So you can see here, this is the first paper uh, or second paper, actually. We introduced um, uh, semantic association in 2002. And I still remember, um, I, we were at UC Georgia and we had this LSDS lab and we had a, a room uh, where this kind of room and people had desks all around and we had a board and I draw, drew the you know the path. Connect the dot. And I said RDF is the formalism to use. That was my contribution. Then came up for the, the work uh, of actual formalization and you know as as so it should do. So this is the first paper. Row queries are, you know, this uh, enabling querying for semantic association on the semantic web. Then there was this second query. By the way, this uh, next one just next to that the 2000 paper. This got the 10 year award for my the ontology alignment work that um, my student, uh, you know, Pratik Jain did. Uh, so, uh, the next paper was this 2000 paper, uh, uh, SEMRANK, Ranking Complex Relationship uh, Search 
results on the semantic web. And then the, the third was the 2007 paper, uh, which is on uh, Spark PL, which is a query language. Somewhere it is here. But um, I think that um, the importance of computing the path, ranking the path, and the applications may, that really are based on connecting the dots, this is a very important thing. This, a rough lineage of, a rough connection of this would be, then we'll later on talk of, next time we'll talk about uh, what by um, you know, the Delroy camera on subgraph extraction techniques and such. But um, uh, this idea of simulation also carried over with um, um, uh, Schooner, right? Because the Schooner we provide a semantic browsing in, right? So what? How, what is the Schooner? What is Schooner about? You have all this biomedical literature, everything in PubMed, right? And you want to be a scientist are using a PubMed search to look for the article. And just like Google, they are getting certain level of results, and that's not too bad. But they want to use the ontology or knowledge graph behind the scene to uh, find the uh, uh, to, to use and use that knowledge in semantic search. So they basically want semantic version of the uh, the bomb bank. Okay. And uh, so what what did you do? So we developed a um, uh, HPCO. Hey, Jinender, can you fix this? Go through all this and get, or, or, yes, or show this guy how to fix it. If you keep fixing my way, it, it won't be good because I already told you we need someone. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, we need someone who has expertise in uh, Wikipedia. Uh, my way is just to host it on GitHub. Oh. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, Vidant and Vishal, you guys can figure out something. I think uh, the person who majorly handled this part, Dr. Seth, was uh, a previous intern who was working with Prime. The Prime Salman, if you remember. Yeah, but I mean, he is not there, right? I don't know if he's still there. He's dead in the university. Uh -huh. Probably a different department. So um, this is the um, uh, work we did um, called um, Human Performance and Cognition Ontology Development. And uh, I'd like you to go through this yourself. Just flip through this. But basically, we uh, had a very uh, hybrid way of uh, creating a large knowledge graph. Then we use that knowledge graph. So you know, steps in creating a car focus domain hierarchy out of Wikipedia. Extract mention of entity generation in the relevant scientific literature department abstracts to support non hierarchical guidance. Map extracted entity mentions to concepts and predicates to relationships to create knowledge base. And then uh, do uh, parsing of, uh, you know, to extract and people and then use uh, animals, animals works on rule based uh, biomedical knowledge repository tables. All these were put together to create a 
knowledge base of two million entities and three million relationship. Then we, of course, that's only one area of the, you know, it's just human performance competition. Then we index entire of my 20 million abstracts with this uh, uh, concept and, uh, you know, this knowledge graph. And then we create the symmetric browsing, which is the school. So, um, um, but the semantic association thing, you know, the other, other point I want to make is that um, given that the whole neural network architecture is based on a fairly low level representation of ones and zeros in the vector form, it has, and given the knowledge graph is far richer in representation, there has to be something in between them. And that's why graph neural network makes sense to the extent we can figure out a way to use that. Right? So I think we have to increasingly go towards tensor and graphs instead of uh, you know, relying on the vectors and everything. So that fundamental process we have to continue to look for. Other interesting dimension here in which I think Chaturun is interested in is this um, use of probabilistic and conditional uh, representations. That's yet another one. For that, uh, Chaturun, if you please look at the uh, you know, last couple of papers by Pramod uh, by Pramod Right? Uh, you, you seen them? Okay, remind me, uh, I will make sure you see that. So here's what we did. See, um, even knowledge graphs, as they represent idea, are not sufficiently expressive. So that's where, uh, for when we started looking at the uh, use case where we have um, one year worth of data on sensor data from San Francisco Bay Area and corresponding Twitter data related to traffic issues, we realized that uh, our uh, knowledge representation needs to be richer and for that we went to probabilistic graph models. In particularly Pramod looked at three broad variety of them and then chose linear dynamical system. And this is explained in this question. And uh, so uh, there will be applications where you remember in the title of my thing there was uh, implicit formal and powerful. The powerful stood for soft or, or soft uh, computing, that will for probabilistic and possibilistic representation and, and computations. So we have seen that too. We, I mean, I basically saw that um, there is a lot of power thing that you get from, uh, you know, implicit semantics using machine learning. There's other thing you get from formal semantics or uh, symbolic uh, reason. As you want to and then you need to go towards even more powerful uh, for that involves this policy. So, you know, why it was chosen, you know, because all of these are going to induce a lot of cost and expensive, right? Uh, and, and, and so you have to worry about it. For example, for promote wanted to compute the normal traffic uh, speed for every link out of thousands of links, you know, every road uh, link, for all the 365 days <laughs> and 24 hours of the year. So that for the hourly basis, you can say whether current, current traffic is abnormal. And then I reason why it is abnormal. That is the essence of Promo's work. In the context, knowledge representative came from three ontologies. A transportation ontology, a smart city ontology, and an ontology related to um, uh, uh, something else I forget. Oh, location. Three different sources. Right? So, a rich uh, uh, representation that can combine all that noise representation, and, uh, you know, uh, because also the data, sensor data is inherently, if that fits well with the Probabilistic, uh, you know, uh, representation. So, 
anyway that was uh, the problem we solved and then the whole thing was um, in terms of explanation so you have to find why the you know when is a traffic slower than normal first you have to find what is the normal traffic for 335 you know uh, 1024 times 365 whatever and then uh, he has to say this is abnormal, what is abnormal, and then you say why it is abnormal based on the data posted on the web on the traffic site or and or based on the uh, Twitter data where the tweets are geospatially located, which relate that is you traffic is slow on this link in, in this hour. Find me the tweets uh, that um, uh, you know are. It, you know that relate to this geography area, potentially originated in that area in that time frame. Filter that for conversations on transportation or traffic, and find the name of the entities or the you know or the transportation thing like for example road surfacing or accident or that, and then make that uh, offer them as a explanation. Right, so very challenging problem. Sometimes someone gets one tool to prepare the query to get the semantic. So first we need to like there are a list of predicates we can we need to select and based on the selection uh, the query is for what was the tool uh, yeah. so I have seen the demo for oh, for the VD? Yeah from the noise There are like three uh, drop down or something. And we need to see oh, there the, 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 oh, oh, so so this was the uh, knowledge based search of scientific literature about Delroy. Yeah. So uh, it two more in the next class, I'm going to take a little different track. Um, you know, why should I don't want to continue doing this because I can take the whole class just discussing these kind of papers. But uh, next class, I want to start with. Um, uh, this uh, I'm just going to do this, and then I, I invite you to spend some time ahead of the time. So what I want you to do is um, look at the students and look at my PhD students. This is of course not been updated. Oh boy, this is quite out of date. 2018, my, that's not good. But I, I'll go through, hopefully we'll I need to update this. Thing. I'll give you the uh, uh, other after Sarasi, those who graduated. And uh, I want to really tell you about the work of each of our students. Uh, and I want you to, you know, I mean, if possible, make a connection to them, to some of them. Uh, and or, or related. So today, for example, very recently, um, uh, Kaushik uh, connected with Pablo Mendes. Uh, uh, Pablo was probably after all this. Yeah, yeah, no, he is pa Pablo. Right? So, um, you know, it would be good to know what they have done and where they are and you know that their journey and that would be a good um, understanding not just both of scientific work and how they're involved but also um, how they're relevant to really building strong careers. Dr. Shet, okay. I was With reading that, uh, I was reading Pablo's work and there is some work on implicit entity extraction that may be relevant to the analogy task. There's one specific okay. Pablo. Right, but you know, the much of the, um, you know, uh, you know, pro I would guess that much of that was already covered here by Sujan's dissertation, because it's all on knowledge driven implicit information extraction. The whole mm. thing was on that.
Also, I posted a comment in the chat. Uh, I guess we never got around to it. If we could talk about that in a future class, which is relevance of e workflow composition to process knowledge or whatever work has been done on workflows. So the that's I'm glad you brought this up. Very that's wonderful. Uh, uh, I was almost uh, you know um, we, we uh, you know very large amount of um, our work has been in this process you know workflow and process part of it. None of us are doing anything here except for the process knowledge part, where we are again in a way researching that work. Uh, yeah, let me think about it. Um, uh, you know, we are not, um, so this whole, you know, major part of computer science, which is about services computing. And uh, in, in that particular part, we have not been active at all recently. But I will see whether there is anything, uh, any, any, right now I'm not immediately seeing the direct knowledge to the process knowledge because I cannot, inspiration, I'm getting it from this medical guidelines kind of thing. While the processes were uh, mostly workflow processes for business automation, uh, you know, manufacturing processes, uh, you know, uh, work, you know, so so whenever you have to do multi-step activity, uh, those processes and workflows have been very important. You know, it, after we did the work, we stopped doing the work because it had become very commercialized and you know established, and there's not no not much new research going on. Uh, right now, it became more engineering rather than scientific and you know research centric. But let me think about it. The um, the the interesting thing that I want to and maybe you can remind me uh, to talk about uh, the work on. Uh, so in this morning, in fact, I uh, brought up this uh, interesting uh, 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 you know point here. Uh, so we have a, a, a work called. Let's see. Oops, I don't know why it's. Do you know what's happening? Anything I touch now it becomes. I'm not getting any. I'm not able to use keyword. So there's this work called Active Semantic Electronic Medical Data. Now, do you know, do you remember that uh, diagram I showed uh, that, uh, where I had SNP 500 annotations, right? So, um, EMR, electric medical record system is very, very well known. And um, this paper, this is two, since 2007, but there is a, a 2005 version of it, or 2006 version of it. Let me see if it is there. Okay. So um, here you have electronic medical record, but uh, what what I thought was, what if we make this electronic record? Um, um, semantic, and what if we understand the language that is used by the doctor? So you can see here, this is an EMR, but the system has done a semantic notation. Here is a chief complaint: evaluation of angina and chest pain, and this would be a concept in a medical ontology, right? Uh, and the, of course, there are you know symptom like itchy, and there are, uh, you know, uh, entities like St. Joseph, which is a hospital, and there are medication. So all these concepts are, uh, you know, not just the uh, text, but they are uh, mapped, uplifted to the 
first steps in ontology, entities in ontology. Right? Then the other interesting thing with ego was that um, there are some rules that drive medical decision making. I'll talk about a simple example. Here, um, there is a um, uh, you know prescription of cumidine uh, and Viagra. Cumidine tablet is a nitrate, and if you apply, if you give the it in conjunction with Viagra, it will have very severe uh, uh, you know medical condition side effect. So um, what we did was to put rules in the ontology. So you concept like, uh, you know, cubidine, you concept like Viagra, you concept like each itching, you concept like uh, uh, epigast, you know, uh, epigastic area, right? So uh, uh, what you want to do is the rule would say that there's a contraindication, meaning don't prescribe at the same time. The contradiction is coming from database. There's a database of observability, good WebMD, and side effect page. So you can extract from that. There are published databases for that. So you take that and then add that to the ontology. Right? So you have ontologies uh, uh, enhanced with rules or knowledge graphs and as rules. And then when you come across the entities, you ask the question: Is that uh, is that rule gets does that rule get fired? And if so, what do you do to say that the fire the rule will fire to say these two have contraindication? Do not prescribe at the same time, and you know so uh, you you are or or you have to override it. Sometimes side effects are the only you know you have to you know you have to leave the side effect because the benefits are bigger, but those are the kind of things that you do so that is active it's semantic uh, because of this you know understanding of the terms and concepts and all that so the active allows you to uh you know for example in i give example of side effect but any other choices of decision making that there will be for example active could be that um you're talking about this uh, uh you know uh, the chronic moderate cramping condition and then you're talking about located in the epigastric area so associated with epigastric area would be variety of uh, you know uh, these uh, symptoms or condition medical conditions and uh, that could be uh, uh, classified as a particular you know disease or medical condition so so forth so that knowledge would get applied uh, when you are uh, you know when you are when you are done so so it's not just a text there that human deeds the system is constantly thinking about what's saying being said there, actively guiding you with what you can do, what you cannot do. If you uh, hover over, over this concept, it can show, pop, you can have a pop up, it can show you all the corresponding concept from the uh, knowledge graph. Ontology. And then you can traverse that like sooner to get to medical literature that you can read up, doctors can't remember anything, new things come up and all the time. So you can provide uh, semantically relevant, uh, 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 you know, um, medical literature or diagnost uh, divided by diagnostics, treatment, blah blah blah. Right. So you can imagine that if you combine com you combine this with Schooner, then uh, you found the um, you know this complaint evolution and genesis plane. Then uh, in the knowledge graph there'll be uh, all the diagnosis of that treatment of that. Uh, you know, village, you know, medication for that. You know that you could provide the doctor to you know uh, check on all of those things. Now you remember, uh, Rakshit, in the product that uh, Ezidi I made earlier. What was that product called? Easy Your one from like medical. Easy fine. Easy fine. So uh, there is basically an extensive medical. Uh, database or uh, dictionary essentially, and uh, providing the doctors contextually relevant, you know, browsing or uh, access to uh, that because it is very important. So the company uh, is the that he worked for uh, had made a commercial product. Uh, did you use the uh, uh, knowledge graph developed for that? Is it fine? Yeah. 
So, so one of the key thing about the XBI was that uh, uh, you know we develop a comprehensive knowledge graph, and that was this intellectual property that is pattern that is provided. Uh, several of my students did uh, internship with the XBI, and uh, they played important role in you know sort of development of technology. But most importantly, the knowledge graph. Sujan came first, I think. Huh? Sujan. Sujan was the first, I think. Yeah. Sujan was the And Sujan did that work, by the way, of uh, extracting uh, new knowledge that uh, from the uh, EMR data that can potentially be added to the knowledge graph from the to enhance it. That's how do we find new knowledge to enhance the uh, knowledge graph? Uh, that's a very important knowledge, uh, knowledge, uh, knowledge graph maintenance and enhancement is a very important uh, you know, and challenging problem. And then he worked on that was his one major work, and the second major work was the inclusion. So here there will be text set where somebody describes the condition but does not give the particular name of the medical condition. So there will be implicit mention here, and uh, he would. Uh, his offer would identify the explicit version of that. And that was just this one. Good. Anything else, guys? Let me uh, take two, three minutes uh, to get the feedback of uh, those who are online. How are you guys surviving? Uh, so I see, well, uh, Vishal is there, Kaushik is there. I can understand that. Um, but um, the others, uh, I guess, uh, the cells have dropped out. Uh, uh, are you guys getting sense of anything? Uh, does it make sense? Yes, I don't know whether Savannah. Yeah, Savannah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure she's caught up. <laughs> a lot of computer science. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm here. All right. I'm good. Okay, guys, I will oh, yeah. end the recording. Yeah.